二零一六何鴻燊博士醫療拓展基金會醫學研討會第三部分現在正式開始，有請實踐大學董事長謝萬雄教授以及係澳門科技大學健康科學學院副院長林偉基教授為我哋主持，有請兩位。而第三部分研討會嘅主講嘉賓分別有烏楊正醫生、趙孝明教授以及係張元斌教授，將時間交俾兩位主持人，唔該曬。好，尊敬嘅宣主席、沈校长、許教授、胡教授，各位親切嘅同事，早晨！感謝同埋歡迎大家喺呢個咁寒冷嘅早上嚟臨參加二零一六年黃新博士醫療拓展基金會同埋香港中文大學聯合主辦嘅醫學研討會嘅第二日嘅議程。今日嘅議程第一個環節，我哋好幸運請到三位嚟自台灣同埋香港卓越嘅專家學者為為我哋做講座。咁講者嘅次序有少少調整，咁俾我介紹咧，係第一位講者咧係烏楊正教授。烏教授係香港中文大學威斯生王醫院內科顧問醫生同埋心臟內科 c a r d i 佢早年喺英國倫敦大學醫科畢業咗之後，先後喺倫敦大學、啊、加拿大嘅英屬哥倫比亞大學同埋美國嘅哈佛大學接受心臟內科嘅訓練同埋工作。佢今日係同我哋講嘅題目係 interventional cardiology。胡教授請。喺二十五分鐘，五分鐘係 A 啊 Q A。Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm uh, delighted to be here to be able to share with you the great developments in interventional cardiology in the past few years. This has been a field that's really changed dramatically. So I'm going to talk about really the big changes in interventional cardiology. Uh, the absorbable scaffold, which is now uh, beginning to replace stenting. The transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVI the left atrial appendage occlusion, LAAO, the mitral clip, and also the change in one of the hardest frontier in interventional cardiology, CTO intervention, how to do CTO intervention by algorithm style. So, why, first of all, the absorbable scaffold. Why are we talking about absorbable scaffold? If we put a stent, a metallic stent into a patient, every year there's a 0.3% risk of the stent occluding suddenly. And obviously, if you have a stent inside, if you need surgery or you need to stop your aspirin in future, there's a risk of stent thrombosis. A stent, if you put into a vessel, after a long period of time, the stress might cause the stent to fracture. Also, if you have a re-narrowing inside the stent, what we call restenosis, putting another layer is not a good solution because increasing number of layers of stent increase the risk of fracture. Coronary disease is occurring in younger patients and also the disease is getting worse. Many of my patients nowadays, they require five, six or even seven stents to treat the disease. So you're beginning to put longer and longer stents with the consequences of stent thrombosis. So about four years ago, the manufacture of a scaffold, a polymer-based absorbable scaffold, replacing a stent has been developed by Abbott Vascular. This is called the BVS. This scaffold is absorbed after it stays in the vessel for about three years, and it leaves behind no trace of the stent. It's less deliverable than traditional metallic stent, and it's less robust, but it has the same efficacy in terms of restenosis and outcome. So this is the demonstration you see at the top the scaffold implanted right afterwards, and these little squares that you see begin to dissolve at six months, and by two years you can see the vessel is like new. So in our practice nowadays, if you are under 70 years old, we consider using this kind of BVS. If you need two stents, BVS is very good, because at the carina, the new division, if you absorb all the stents, you can have a new vessel altogether. Patients who need surgery in the near future, this is a group that should have BVS. Uh, if you have a metallic stent that has restenosis, that's another indication for considering BVS. Obviously, because BVS is less deliverable, we still use it in easier lesions. 
This is the next generation. Now, this is not yet available. This is a magnesium absorbable stent developed by Biotronic, and this absorbs even faster than BVS. Within 12 months, it's disappeared. It's metallic, so it's better in terms of de deliverance, and it's also stronger in radial strength. So it functions pretty much like our metallic stents. So this uh, stent has a similar late loss to all the stents we see nowadays in the market. And the stent is called Dreams, and uh, it's 12 months reabsorption. It's got better performance and almost equivalent delivery ability to drug stents. So this will be available this year, at the end of this year. Scaffold, I'm not sure, is not going to answer all the questions and all the problems of interventional coronary work. But I think scaffolds will dominate the market. It will gradually replace stents. There will be many companies that will develop many scaffolds, and you'll have a great choice of scaffolds to treat your patients with. And gradually, it will be increasingly used in more and more complicated subgroups of diseases, including total occlusion. So moving quickly on, the next topic I want to talk about is TAVI. TAVI is a transcatheter, minimally invasive implantation of an aortic valve for aortic stenosis. And this is a range of the TAVI valves. Severe aortic stenosis is a very common condition, but it occurs mostly in the elderly. And many of the patients are too old, too frail, or too high surgical risk. In Asia, in this area, many patients don't like to have a big scar. They don't like to have open heart surgery. And so, it's particularly relevant to the Asia Pacific area. These patients, they do badly when they are treated just with medicines. And they also don't do well with high risk surgery. So, a minimally invasive aortic valve replacement is a very good solution. And now there's been a lot of data supporting the use of this. TAV versus medical therapy. If you don't do surgery versus doing a transcatheter implantation, this is the difference. In 24 months, you gain a 20% absolute mortality benefit. One in five patients less die after 24 months. This is a huge mortality benefit in terms of clinical trial. TAV versus surgical AVR for very high risk patients. And you see equivalent. This is a 60 month data from the partner trial, the original trial. And you see, for very high risk surgery, if you do a percutaneous valve, you do just as well 60 months later. This is the core valve pitotal trial. So this is a newer valve, again, comparing high risk surgery against the TAVI, and you actually have a benefit. You have a 6% absolute benefit in terms of all cause mortality within 24 months. So the newer valves actually are even better than the original Edwards valve. So in summary, superior treatment when compared to medical therapy in patients who are not operable. Superior treatment when compared to surgical ADR in patients who are at high risk. Superior treatment option compared to surgical ADR in extreme risk patients. It's a superior treatment probably in all categories. The cost unfortunately is uh, 20 260,000 Hong Kong dollars, so it's very expensive treatment, but as more valves develop, this cost will come down. So now we have a very good treatment for aortic stenosis. Next is LAAO. This is left atrial appendix occlusion. As you know, one of the problems is atrial fibrillation. Uh, increasingly, as our patient population is getting older, atrial fibrillation is becoming more prevalent. Traditionally, we use warfarin to treat atrial fibrillation to prevent strokes. Nowadays, we have new oral anticoagulants, NOAC. But many patients still cannot tolerate NOAC or warfarin due to bleeding. It may be something very benign, like having hemorrhoids or diverticulosis that will stop you being treated. These patients are a good candidate for LAO. Most of the clots from atrial fibrillation come from the left atrial appendage. If you put an umbrella to block the left atrial appendage, you actually prevent stroke. This is the pivotal trial, the Watchman clinical trial called PROTECT AF. You see the second trial here, which compared uh, the warfarin compared to LAO occlusion 
uh, in terms of CV death, in terms of stroke, in terms of all cause mortality. And you can see in terms of Watchmen, there's continuing registries and trials to demonstrate its efficacy. This is the Protect AF data, and you see the primary efficacy, CV death, and all cause stroke is all lower compared to warfarin. Warfarin is not a good treatment for stroke. So LAO, again, superior treatment options compared to warfarin. It's a non-inferior treatment for, for stroke prevention, but it's superior for disabling and major strokes. It's superior to warfarin in terms of quality of life, and it's superior for cardiovascular death. So it's a superior treatment uh, for most cases if you compare to warfarin. How does it compare to NOAC? Well, we don't have the answer yet. So LAO is now becoming, a, again, one of these treatments that's available for patients who cannot take traditional therapy. The people who fall outside what medicine can treat currently can now be treated. Finally, another device in this category is the MitraClip. The MitraClip is a clip that can be delivered percutaneously in a minimal invasive manner to clip the mitral valve to reduce mitral regurgitation. It's for patients with severe mitral regurgitations who are too high risk for operation. The aim is to improve the quality of life because most of these people have very bad left ventricles and they are not going to live very long. And so far it's been done mostly from registry data. And the European registries have been as large as almost a thousand patients and they demonstrate very effective reduction in mitral regurgitation and very efficient improvement in the patient's quality of life. Patients go from a bed-bound patient with heart failure to somebody who can walk around at home, on the ward, and even outdoors. And it has a very low 30-day and one-year mortality and good complication rates. So the MitraClip is a very effective therapy for heart failure class 4 patients who are too high risk for surgery who have severe microregurgitation. And this again treats one group who are outside the borders of current medical therapy. Finally, CTO. As we know, about five, six years ago, this hybrid algorithm written by the Americans have dominated the CTO market. And this algorithm approach, a way of saying how you should do each case, running down an algorithm, has been shown to be very effective. But there are some things that are not so good about the hybrid algorithm, mainly because the cross pulse and stainless device, which it depends on, is very expensive. And the and the techniques are not widely available. So we formed a CTO club, which is I'm one of the directors, and you can see the group here, from all over Asia Pacific region. And from this club, we developed an algorithm to treat a new algorithm to treat CTO. And I think algorithm treatment of CTO is really the new frontier of treating this difficult barrier in interventional cardiology. You can read more about it in our website, uh, APCTO Club. So we have also a retrograde uh, algorithm and an IBIS algorithm, but I'm not going to show you the details of this. The main difference is uses the strength available in Asia, which is IBIS, new generation wires, parallel wire. It also has the American influence, the cross boss thin ring, and it's all about using knowledge to overcome difficulties. And it's a highly knowledge-based algorithm. And it incorporates proctoring, hands-on teaching, improved success rate, and obviously we're doing a registry to prove the efficacy of this algorithm. So the future of intervention. I think the future looks very bright. A lot of off-the-radar forgotten cases now, like patients very old with aortic stenosis, like patients with very bad heart failure with mitral regurgitations, can now all be treated. More and more valvular disease can be treated in this way. There's now percutaneous mitral valve replacement. Absorbable stents would dominate the market, and you'll be able to treat far more disease, leaving by behind very little metal. And the knowledge-based driven algorithm to treat CTO will break through this barrier in interventional cardiology. So I recommend this bright future to you. Thank you. Thank you.
我我唔識問嗰啲呢個 mental terms。咁頭先你講嘅 elders， 真係好 interesting 喎。我唔知係咩嚟㗎，當然詳細嘅。譬如話，嗰啲人過咗拍中風，我都點驚啊！咁即係嗰啲人就話嗰個心板咧，嗰個血咧麻麻地，嗰嗰個心臟一成日都散下散下，突然間一擠，就擠咗塊咧，塊咧做咗個腦度，做咗個腦度，咁就中風啦。咁頭先你講個 elders 就係唔係講醫嗰度醫咗第二度啊嘛？咁我可唔可以磨喺度？即係好似個天龍地磨咁磨，就 stop 呢啲咁嘅血塊咧，去去到個腦度。嗯。咁我咪嗰個中風嗰個機會咪誒希望減低咯咁樣。係係啊，其實你對呢個心臟嗰個令到中風嗰個瞭解都好深入啊，其實。我係好 potential 嘅，係啊嘛。係，咁其實咧兩樣都有㗎。咁呢個心意風度咧，就係整個網阻住佢開始有嗰啲血塊嘅，係啦。咁但係咧，而家咧亦有一個網咧，係擺喺佢腦嗰啲血管嗰度。咁我哋做呢個 test 嘅時候咧，會擺個網咧嚟防止啲血塊上去個腦嗰度，亦有嘅。咁所以其實你諗嗰兩個嗰個方法咧，都而家有做緊嘅。咁亦係一個好有效嘅方法嚟嘅。<笑>我應該幾時做啱咧？有個個七日四啦。啊，其實咧就我諗第一步咧就係你有冇 AF， 因為如果你有 AF 有心律不穩咧，咁你中風嘅機會會高啊。咁所以第一樣嘢咧就要 check 有冇 AF。咁而家有個好叻嘅喎，我 iPhone 嗰度咧，佢後面咧有塊嘢咧可以貼喺嗰個蓋嗰度咧，你撳隻手指落去就睇到有冇 AF 嘅喎。好抵嘅就好似二百蚊到嘅啫，係啊可以可以買嘅 download 嘅 app， 我諗阿胡教授都知道啲啲點樣整嘅呢個。好，陳校長。Thank you for introducing all this new technology、uh, in interventional cardiology. But whenever there is a new device, there is a paradigm shift, and all the indications might also change. For example, in the past. Uh, you only put in a stent when the artery is 90% occluded. But now with this skate toy, bioabsorbable, it is so safe and it makes a perfect artery diameter. Will you then change uh, the indication? You do it much earlier and so on. This is my first question. So how much would the uh, usual guidelines need to be uh, uh, you know, revisit and revise. And my second question is, it's, when new technology is being introduced, it's always very exciting. But sometimes we may not be able to see the long-term effect. I know some of your slides show two years, you have improvement in mortality 20%, but what about five years, what about seven years? Would there be complications arising at the later stage that we have not been able to predict because the time is still short. Thank you for those two very good questions. In fact, the first question, which is to uh, whether it's worth now doing lesions that are maybe less stenotic or maybe acute lesions, uh, rupture. So there is a big randomized control trial being conducted by SJ Park in Korea called the definitive trial to answer this problem. So it's a randomized trial uh, in patients who came in with uh, acute coronary syndrome to do an OCT to see how narrow it is, whether there's blood rupture. And then, in the lesion that's not significant, they randomize to either putting in a scaffold or not putting in anything. And this is going to be followed up for five years, so to see a five-year outcome. So this trial will give us the data probably by the 2019, 2020, we'll have the five-year data. The one-year data will come out, but the power calculation suggests one year is not going to make a difference because an acute lesion that you put a scaffold in is going to take longer to see the difference. So probably the we'll have... The guideline has not been changed. No. So we're waiting for the randomized control trial. So another five or six years time, if this randomized control trial is positive, then I think it will push for, towards the guidelines being changed. So that, that's the um, first. The second question was... <laughs> Long-term long data. So we have um, all these randomized trials have been done and they keep collecting data for five years, ten years. But the part of the problem is the technology is developing too quickly. Uh, the next generation of ours is already out, and the next generation when they do their initial data is also better than the last generation. 
So by the time your 10-year data comes out, your two-year data of a new valve is better, and so people keep using the new technology. There's also the registry which helps us. So the registry has picked up some issues with TAVI, that there is valve thrombosis. Uh, and, but there's also valve thrombosis with mechanical valves. So, you know, is we pick up things that we didn't see in the randomized controlled trial, but it's not at a very high rate that causes us to worry. So we always worry about a new device that you start putting into a lot of patients, and then a lot of problems come. So that's why now TAVI is still limited, really, uh, to patients who are you know, either very ill or uh, very old, um, so that the long-term outcome we're not so worried about. Uh, but I think there, when we have the 10, 20-year data, if it looks very good, we'll start putting it into much younger patients. In other words, although this new technology uh, looks very exciting, we should not jump into it too quickly. We should still take a cautious approach and wait for more data until the guideline uh, is modified. Am I correct? Yes, I think uh, for something like a scaffold, you must wait for the guideline to change. You shouldn't jump into it and put into it without evidence. For something like TAVI, there's already very good evidence for short-term outcome. So I think you can jump into it for patients who are going to be short-term. Uh, you know, you're 96 year old, or recently we had a 100 year old with severe AS, you should jump into it because two years they have better outcome and they're not likely to live beyond 102. So, but for the younger patients, you should be cautious, especially the under 70 group. Uh, you be careful, there are many people living beyond 102. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh 所以他們結得很快所以甩就極少有 好,如果大家不介意,我們準時完成 